Good morning, everyone. We will wait a few seconds to let all the participants in. Okay, I think uh, we can start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Luigi Colucci from Tast IT Services. I'm, I'm part of the communication team at Escape. I am uh, happy to welcome you to the Escape ASAP and Citizen Science webinar. During today's webinar, we will talk about how various services, data products, and tools from across the Escape project have been integrated into the S3 Science Analysis Platform system. We will also demonstrate how the escape citizen science has helped s in solving the deepest secret of the universe. Uh, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat or in the QA um, box. We will address them at the end of all the various presentation. Our first speakers is John Zwin um, Zwinbank from Astron and uh, the escape s science analysis platform activity leaders that will give us an overview of the escape as of uh, over to you john thank you thank you luigi all right so i have just a few minutes to give you a very brief overview as to what esap is the escape science platform toolkit um i will primarily use this to provide some context and then I will hand over to the next speakers who will show some of the ways that we're actually putting ESAP to use in, in practice. So first let me show you ESAP in the context of the ESCAPE cluster, the ESCAPE EOSC cluster. So as you're probably aware, the ESCAPE project has a number of different work packages covering all the various different aspects of e-infrastructure that are necessary to run major European research infrastructures. That includes things like bulk data storage and management, the software and services repository interfacing with the virtual observatory, and of course, citizen science systems. But um, ESAP, highlighted here in the top of this diagram is really our attempt to draw all those various threads together and pre present all those services and potentially other services through a single unified user-friendly coherent user experience. So ESAP is really kind of the, the capstone on the services offered through the ESCAPE project. What do we mean when we say science platforms? Well, the first thing to realize is that, of course, many people talk about science platforms. So I'm, I'm putting here just a bunch of logos for various projects that are available around the Internet and across the scientific community that kind of vaguely answer to the description of science platform. And one of the things that, that maybe we struggle with is a little bit that a science platform is all things to all people. So to make it really concrete here, when we talk about a science platform in this context, we're talking about somewhere that scientists can go to access and share data and results, but also to work with advanced analysis tools and apply them to those results and that data. And then, but also to work as part of a wider context on the understanding that um, each of us and each of the research infrastructures we work with is part of a wider wider ecosystem of scientific research and we want to be able to integrate with and use services and data from a wide variety of sources across that ecosystem so that's kind of the mission that we're trying to address with esap as a system how do we go about it well we think of esap as what i've called here a service hub it's a focal point where we can draw together a variety of different services and present them to users in a coherent and consistent way. So we do that by building ESAP in two parts. First of all, we provide a web-based user interface, which the idea is this is a single user interface, whatever the service, whatever the use case the end user has, they'll be able to go to that user interface and get a, a consistent way of working with their data and accessing the capabilities that they're interested in using. But then that, user interface talks to what we call the API gateway. And that API gateway is a hub that reaches out and acts as a broker between a variety of different services that are sort of sitting out there in the escape project ecosystem or on the wider scientific ecosystem across the internet. 
And those different services can take a variety of, of different forms. I've suggested a number here, everything from you know, accessing different types of software and data to accessing compute services, generating persistent identifiers, performing user authentication and authorization, et cetera. We can't possibly anticipate all of the different services that ESAP users might want to interact with. So what we do is we make it possible for users to add new services to ESAP by providing a plug-in system, making ESAP really a very extensible system. Within the context of Escape, then, we use that plugin system to integrate with a variety of different services that are drawn from across the Escape project. So what I'm showing here on the right-hand side of this diagram are all the different types of services that ESAP might interact with. And they range from catalog data, so looking at things like lists of sources on a, measured on astronomical images or lists of those images themselves, to software repositories and how they can interact with how they can feed into interactive data analysis services, to bulk data storage like the data lake, or in even high performance computing and batch computing and workflow systems. And beneath that diagram, as I, I've labeled it with the, the letters, which you may be familiar with corresponding with the other escape work packages. So that includes SIVO, the virtual observatory, and um, OSSR, the open source software and services repository, DIOS, the data infrastructure for open science, and particularly relevant for this webinar, uh, CS, the citizen science system, which you'll hear much more about in 20, 25 minutes time. Now, the idea here is that we don't run ESAP as a service. The escape project is a fixed time development effort. Uh, we really think of ourselves as the software developers rather than the service providers for ESAP. So instead, we provide ESAP as a toolkit. And for the various research infrastructures that are part of Escape, or perhaps other research infrastructures in the future, they can pick up the ESAP toolkit. They can configure it to meet their needs. They can write plugins or use existing plugins to integrate with their own services. And then they can deploy it and use it to provide services to their particular end user community. When they do that, they end up with something that looks a little bit like this. There's a, I've thrown a whole bunch of screenshots here uh, together with some uh, sort of splashes indicating the different types of functionality. But really, you'll, what the user will see is a modern looking uh, web application built with standard open source technologies like Python and Django and React. It lets them query and work with a bunch of different archives, load a variety of different software products from the escape repositories integrated with the escape identity and access management, interoperating with virtual observatory services, providing interactive data analysis to Jupyter systems, work, working with binder hub services. So really a pretty full featured uh, interactive analysis environment. But really what I want, I want to get to is, is not that you listen to me tell you that, but that you hear from some of these research infrastructures. Uh, that can tell you about how they are investigating and, and thinking about putting ESAP to work for them. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking and hand over to the next speakers coming from CTAO and SKAO to tell you about how those major infrastructures are putting ESAP to work for them. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, John. Um, I hope everybody can hear me, see me, and see my slides. If not, uh, shout. So, yeah, my name is Gareth Hughes, and I'll be talking about ESAP, uh, Trenkov Telescope Array, and its data challenges. Firstly, uh, for anybody who's, who's not familiar, I'm going to give you a 30 second introduction to atmospheric gamma ray astronomy. It's a relatively young field of astronomy. Uh, the first source was only detected in 1989, being the Crab Nebula. And the basic idea is you have a, a gamma ray coming from uh, a source out there in the galaxy or universe somewhere, and it hits the atmosphere uh, a couple of tens of kilometers above. And uh, that, the high energies we're looking at, the atmosphere is uh, opaque to gamma rays. And so you have an interaction which causes a shower of secondary particles these particles in turn uh, emit a faint blue flash uh, of UV, um, blue UV light on the ground. And if you have a large enough reflector and a quick enough camera, you can reconstruct that shower in the atmosphere 
and get the arrival direction and energy of the primary particle. We don't obviously have time to go into detail about uh, why, why we're doing this, but um, needless to say, you can uh, read up uh, by following this link. Um, we basically look at very uh, the most extreme environments uh, in, in the universe. Jacob Telescope Array itself will be the first ground-based gamma ray observatory. All the other experiments of this nature up to this point have been um, closed uh, collaborations. And so we will be responsible for providing data and science tools to a worldwide user community. And that means we need some form of science platform or portal. And that's what the ESAP offers uh, ourselves and other ESFRIs, the main building blocks to build this platform and to tailor it potentially to, and test for specific uh, purposes. So John just mentioned the, the, the modularity, and here's a, a nice example of that. Uh, if your service that you want to add has uh, an, a REST API or a Python library, you'll be able to use the modularity of the ESAP to, to add that service. So in this case, uh, here you can see the EOSSR library, which is used to interact with uh, the software repository uh, coming from Escape. And this uh, has been added and you can see us using it to search uh, CTAO community entries on Zenodo and find the instrument response function for CTAO. Um, I mentioned before about uh, connecting software and data, and the ESAP has a, an interactive analysis part uh, to it. Uh, through this um, uh, software repository, which is also part of Escape, uh, several CTAO related software packages have been added, including Gamma Pi and um, AGN Pi. And you can go to uh, an instance of the science platform, click interactive analysis, search for say AGN Pi, and then search for a, for example, my binder instance, and then spin up an environment where you have access to all of the correct um, software and modules, and even uh, tutorials, which will enable you, for example, to do a, a fit to an AGN spectral energy distribution. Um, and here, I think, uh, Gamma Pi and AGN Pi both working together in order to, to simulate and to actually uh, fit the data. And there you can see the, the fitted result to that. This also uh, helps with sort of foster cross collaboration where you can potentially have uh, workflows from different ESFRIs uh, working uh, in conjunction with each other. Another uh, case is, well, aside from interactive analysis or besides interactive analysis is batch analysis. And this was particularly interesting for CTAO as we have uh, specific use cases where we have observations coming from over a long period of time from many telescopes. And so you end up with uh, a lot of data in a lot of separate files, but you will have the same workflow that you'd like to apply to it. And so in this case, you'd want to parallelize this, you'd want to use a workload management system in order to be able to put one job on one node or CPU each and uh, increase your efficiency. Um, in CTA, we use a, a software package called Dirac as a workload management system. And so a place for that has been added into the ESAP. You can see here, you could submit a batch job, monitor a batch job. Uh, in a similar way to the interactive analysis, you can look for workflows. Here in this image, you can see that the, the Concordia workflow has been selected. Concordia is uh, also another part of Escape. It's a, a joint uh, package developed by uh, CTA and KM3Net uh, contributors. Once you've selected that, you can select uh, how you would like to, to deploy this package. And then you can select um, the input parameters um, based on sort of steering files for that uh, for the the workflow that you've been you've selected, and then you can submit your job. This actually works with the uh, asynchronous worker part of the ESAP, which enables everything to be um, uh, enables the ESAP to be much more efficient. Finally, I'd just like to mention the fact that uh, a couple of CTAO colleague institutes 
have been able to deploy the ESAP themselves. So CSCS in Switzerland and Observatoire de Paris in France uh, have deployed their own versions um, using a various different techniques, including Kubernetes. Uh, they found it to be easily customizable, easy to set up. They changed things like the uh, ANA system, so how you log in. They added additional workflows, and they added additional metadata for, for ease of searching of that workflow. And this work has also sort of fed back a little bit into our work package within Escape. Uh, they also added uh, easily binder hub instances to enable them to, to launch these, these workflows. And uh, looking at ways that this could potentially be used in a CTAO science data challenge. So, in conclusion, the ESAP provides an excellent toolbox from which, uh, from one, uh, from which one can build and tailor a science platform. We've been able to identify key technologies and ideas which we will investigate further, uh, and the science platform itself is easily deployable and customizable. And we look forward to uh, working together with others on future topics. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Garrett, for your presentation. Uh, our next speaker is James Collinson from the Square Kilometer Array Observatory that will present the ESCAPE ASAP SCAO use case. Over to you, James. Sorry, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, so um, hello everyone, uh, I'm James um, and I'm an operations data scientist here at the SKO, uh, so based at our headquarters in Jodrell Bank. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a very quick summary of the activities that we've been working on in the ESCAPE project, particularly with respect to ESAP um, and the technologies for the future SKA science platform. Okay, so I'll set the scene with a bit of background to the SK project and the role of the SK regional centers. So the SRCs, um, as we call them, are the distributed network of data centers that our user community will use to retrieve and process their data. Um, so then I'll talk about some of the prototyping activities that we've undertaken as part of uh, the ESCAPE project, and I'll try and relate these to the uh, SRC capabilities and architecture to show where they fit in the bigger picture. And finally, there have been a wealth of other benefits to us of being part of the ESCAPE project. Uh, so the most obvious here is the network of experts that we've had the opportunity to work with. There's also been the exposure to some lower level technologies and practices, which are definitely worth mentioning too. Okay, so the SKA project will develop, construct and operate the two largest radio interferometers in the world. Uh, and today is a particularly significant day for us as it marks the official start of construction activities in the host countries, which you may have seen in the news. Um, so the SKA mid interferometer is under construction in the Karoo Desert of South Africa and comprises of 197 dishes. And then there's the low interferometer in the Murchison Radio uh, Observatory, and that's made up of around 130,000 antennas. And this observes a frequency range just below that of the mid telescope. So there are precursor instruments already generating data, but our main science programs will start in around 2028 with an initial observatory lifetime of about 50 years. So the SK Low Array is, as I mentioned, an electronic telescope with no moving parts. So accordingly, all of the pointing of the beam on the sky is controlled by electronics and software. So within the array itself, there are computers that constrain the effective field of view of the beam and that produces around a factor of 250 reduction in the raw data size going from antenna voltages to signals sent to the central signal processor. So there's one of these for each telescope array. And they produce some high level data products like visibilities and transient candidates. And those um, are ingested by the science data processes. So these two supercomputers are what generate the actual observatory data products and feed these into the network of SRCs. So 100 gigabits per second is a reasonable upper limit for the transfer rate of reduced sort of observatory data products into the data center network. So in addition to showing that this is a big data science project. The point here is that the SRC network is you know, key to how scientists will be able to access and process the SKA data and turn that into science outcomes. So that brings us on to the capabilities that the SRCs must have. But for the purpose of this presentation, I think we can just focus on a handful of these. So the user will need to be able to discover their data, no matter where, which SRC site it's physically stored at. Uh, and they should be able to 
use standard interfaces such as those recommended by the International Virtual Observatory Alliance to achieve this. Then the user will need to be able to stage compute at the data locations to interactively process that data using custom scripts or notebooks to develop workflows depending on their particular scientific interest. There will also need to be a related but separate capability up here in the top right uh, for performing larger scale batch-like processing on the data on larger clusters. So this may include the user wishing to scale up an interactive workflow that they've developed, or it could be the generation of more advanced data products and project level data products from the observatory data products. So the backbone to all of these tasks is the data management tool, which is the key to enabling these. So as I mentioned before, we want to federate our data lake essentially across the, all of the SRC sites to maximize the storage efficiency, but also maintain data integrity. So if we switch over to a logical view of you know, where some of these components that enable these capabilities may sit, um, the users will interact with a science platform at the top level, which will make calls to an API layer. And that in turn will query the appropriate backend services such as the data management tool or the AI um, tool. So Scape has allowed us to identify candidates for a number of these components, which have shown uh, you know, approximately here. So in particular, Rusho is a good candidate for the data manager. Indigo IAM offers uh, AAI and ESAP provides a higher level user facing platform, which brings together these various components, uh, including a means of data discovery. But I should point out these are, aren't the only candidates uh, that are being considered for each component at this stage. So that's the high level. Let's drill down now into some of the specifics of the steps that um, we've been taking as part of the ESCAPE project to en towards enabling this functionality. So on the ESAP front itself, the SK didn't initially have any existing data archives to integrate with the central gateway, but a number of the precursor instruments such as LOFAR have existing data archives that, um, that could be integrated and our colleagues at Astron were able to add those into the data discovery part of the website. So that's a really nice proof of concept for how such archives need to be structured to facilitate this. Um, meanwhile, at SKO, we were granted access to compute resources for SRC testing at SDFC Cloud. So to manage the user interaction with these resources, um, we deployed a notebook platform based on JupyterHub as a proto-science platform for building and testing early SRC workflows. Initial improvements to this included integrating with the escape IAM for authentication and then adding persistent storage for attaching larger data sets to the compute instances. But we also needed finer control over the software provision in these environments, which we added. Um, so we could achieve this by adding a binder service like Gareth already mentioned to dynamically build environments based on compliant code repositories. And simultaneously, we deployed an instance of the Rusho data orchestrator uh, at SDFC Cloud to further enable us to run sort of data transfer tests between the SK telescope sites. So this includes data centers in South Africa and Australia, in addition to a number of other SK partner countries. And so we've got automated functional tests that test transfers across the whole grid of sites uh, and a monitoring stack to help identify and flag problems as they occur. Now, of course, Rusho and the wider data management prototyping were the focus of Work Package 2, as John mentioned earlier. But the reason for bringing it up here is that more recently, we've been integrating this Rusho instance with the JupyterHub prototype I just talked about, uh, using technology developed at CERN and within Work Package 2 uh, to replicate the so-called data lake as a service. So this is sort of a, a one step in the direction of being able to bring compute to the data itself, which is obviously a key goal for us and the next generation of big science experiments. So that brings us to the current state of uh, the SRC network prototyping. So from 2022, a new global team of teams form, formally started work to develop and build prototypes as the first stage in their wider development. Uh, so escape candidates are now being, uh, like technology candidate size are now being expanded and more widely tested. So we've deployed an SKA Indigo IAM instance, added further Rusho storage sites, and have separate Jupyter Hub instances at a number of sites which are being integrated with Rusho. This is on top of the expertise that some partners, particularly the telescope host countries, already have with the precursor data analysis infrastructure. The ESAP itself is a candidate for further exploration in the science analysis platform prototype stream, and a number of the ESAP developers and contributors at Astron are now directly involved in the SRC prototyping activities. In the case of ESAP, it's probably its modularity that John was talking about before, which sets it um, ahead of some of the more um, established uh, science 
um, platform prototypes. So we're a ways off SKA data delivery yet, but we hope to use the science data challenges to test early systems. So for instance, we're currently um, using Rusio to form part of the data distribution model for science data challenge three. So we want to move that data to sites supporting the data challenge, and we're hoping to use Rusio to form part of that. Uh, as we take, uh, uh, so we're planning to take advantage of these challenges as test beds where possible to test early systems with the user community and get that early customer feedback. And just before I wrap up, it's worth mentioning here the range of other benefits that being part of the Escape project has brought us. So first and foremost, like I mentioned before, the network of experts that we've been able to work with to learn more about these technologies and collaboratively solve some of these challenges with. We've also been exposed to a range of cloud technologies like Kubernetes that are becoming increasingly ubiquitous in our collective fields and in the industry more widely. So we've also delivered a lot of value in particular back to the Rusio community through the automated, uh, the automated integration testing that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this initially identified a number of issues in particular with token-based authentication flows that hadn't been picked up previously, which led to upstream improvements in the Rusio code base. So it's worth stressing the value, I guess, of automated full integration tests when we're considering these complex multi-layer platforms. So I think I'm probably out of time now, So, uh, but that is all I wanted to say today. So thanks very much for listening. OK. Um, thank you, John, for your presentation. Now I'll give the word back to John that will share with us the escape as of future plans. Thank you, John. Thanks, Luigi. And thanks to both Gareth and James for your talks. So I'm going to take just another couple of minutes to uh, wind up this section on ESAP by talking about where we go from here. So many of you will be aware that the ESCAPE project has been running since 2019, but the, the official funded end of the ESCAPE project is in early 2023. So we're really in the final stages now. And I think then as we go forward, there are two different ways in which um, ESAP and the other technologies from ESCAPE should, should, are looking towards the future. And so the first of these is exactly what, what Gareth and James have both spoken to. I mean, I think that we have provided through ESAP a compelling set of tools that many research infrastructures, including both CTAO and SKAO, have been evaluating, and we hope they will continue to evaluate and to use and to build upon them into the future. And I think we move from a regime in which the escape project itself is funded to produce ESAP out of its own resources to a model in which those big research infrastructures are collaborating on producing ESAP and related tooling because it's in everybody's best interest to develop these common tools and work on them together as a community. So that's one part of the puzzle. The other thing is what, what are the what's the work that remains to be done? I'm not going to go through this in any detail now in the interest of time, but I think what I hope by throwing a bunch of bullet points at you here the, po the point I want to reach is that there's a lot of exciting work that still is outstanding in this area. I think we've shown through the work that's been done on ESAP already that we can put together a really compelling product, something that is of interest to major research infrastructures like SKO and CTAO. But also we have just begun to, to kind of scratch the surface in terms of some of the really deep and, and high impact problems that can be solved by taking this approach. So I think there's this ranges from modest technical improvements and enhancements to the system that we've built so far to really thinking very ambitiously about be building federated network of networks of science platforms that enable us to build really powerful cross disciplinary cross research infrastructure systems. Ultimately building towards the kind of the concept of a virtual observatory type system for science platforms, I think the opportunities here are really exciting. And I very much hope that both the existing research infrastructure, small and large, involved in the escape project, but also perhaps some of our audience here today will want to join and, and follow us on that journey and, and help us by contributing your own code and ideas. And should you want to do that, I will leave you with this slide of uh, URLs and getting started resources. So here are, if you're interested in learning more about ESAP, you can follow some of the links here to take a look at the documentation, take a look at some of the installation and deployment instructions, browse around the code. And if you want to get involved, 
you can follow that link to issues and outstanding work. And that will give you a hint at some of the things that we are currently working on and where you might join us and jump in. I really hope to see you there. And at that point, I will stop speaking. Thank you so much. Thank you, John, for your presentation. Now for the second part of our webinar, um, our first speaker is Stephen Sergent from the Open University and Escape Citizen Science Activity Leader that will provide an overview of the Escape Citizen Science. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Marvelous. Let's see if I can make this work. Brilliant. Okay, so yes, I'm going to talk about the uh, citizen science in uh, Escape, and it's quite closely related to the uh, the science platform work that we've been hearing about so far. So, uh, citizen science is one of the uh, key services that the Escape project is uh, providing. And so here it is among the other things. So for example, the data lake, the virtual observatory and the science platforms that we have um, uh, just been hearing about. And this is because citizen science provides a scientific functionality that does not exist through any other means. So for example, uh, I'd like you to imagine that uh, you have, let's say, uh, a facial recognition problem. You want to find faces in images. Now, there are plenty of machine learning algorithms that off the shelf that will do this for you. OK, so uh, you've deployed your machine learning algorithm and here are the faces. So oh, you see immediately the problem is that uh, the machine will recognize the faces and 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 uh, 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 point out where in the images they are, but the human being would be able to look at this and take a step back and sort of unask the fundamental question and say there is a clown in the middle of the image. Okay, so so humans interrogating data can do things that no machine learning at the moment are capable of doing. And that's just one, uh, one example of the many things that humans can do uh, scientifically. Um, so you could imagine having uh, uh, a, a science platform uh, working with data in the, uh, the European Open Science Cloud Escape Data Lake, from which you run a crowdsourced data analysis project uh, citizen science, and then the volunteers will be able to jump out into the more accessible tools. So, for example, the vir virtual observatory tools, and then uh, a small subset may be able to uh, jump into a deeper analysis. So, this is our vision for how we see uh, uh, citizen science, crowdsourced data mining, working uh, in Escape. So, our aspiration from the beginning has been to open up the uh, the Esfries to the general public by creating and managing and operating harmonized uh, mass participation experiments and developing machine learning tools uh, and creating educational resources to curate their experience and creating online forums for dialogue with professionals. Um, and we've been doing that by creating uh, uh, notebooks that you can pick up and adapt and we'll be hearing more about these uh, later on uh, uh, today. So I won't go through these just now. Um, so our, our broadly, our vision is that uh, we have experts interacting with the European Open Science Cloud who are leading the way for the science-inclined public. And I, uh, so today we'll be hearing about uh, projects that are uh, precursors to the Vera Rubin LSST, and also we'll be hearing about managing citizen science projects from uh, within uh, ESAP. I will just say that this is uh, these activities are not simply focused on astronomy and astroparticle physics. We also have projects uh, well outside uh, these discipline areas in uh, social sciences and, uh, and overseas development. And that's everything I want to say for now. Okay, thank you, Stephen, for your presentation. Our next speaker is James Pearson from Opera University that will present the Galaxy Zoo Cosmic Down. Over to you, James. Hello, yes. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, through the support of Escape, um, I, along with Hugh Dickinson and Stephen Sargent at the Open University, along with the Galaxy Zoo team, 
um, have been working on a new iteration of Galaxy Zoo, in this case called Galaxy Zoo Cosmic Dawn. And as Stephen said, this is a precursor for LSST Rubin. Um, and it is the latest iteration of Galaxy Zoo, which is the longest running and most popular project on the Zooniverse citizen science platform. So I'll start with sort of a quick overview is that um, one of the core aims of extragalactic astronomy is to study how galaxies form and evolve over cosmic time. So galaxies come in a variety of shapes, from ball-like ellipticals to those with grand spiral arms, like those in the images here. Uh, and so to study how they evolve requires a large number of classified galaxies. This is where citizen science comes in. It helps play a crucial role in the examination of these large data sets that we get from telescopes. So Zooniverse is the world's largest and most popular platform for people-powered research. Um, it's made possible by volunteers, so more than a million people from around the world who come together to assist professional research. Um, and Galaxy Zoo is one of the projects, and it asks volunteers to classify images based on their visual appearance. This gives the public the opportunity to com contribute meaningfully to a scientific discovery in astronomy. Um, well, also helping to inspire the next generation of students and scientists. So Galaxy Zoo has seen multiple iterations over its 15 year lifespan, and volunteers are presented with an image as shown on the left um, and asked to answer several questions from Galaxy Zoo's decision tree. So starting off with saying, is it a smooth galaxy or are there features of it on it? Um, are there any signs of a spiral arm pattern? How many spiral arms are there? Um, how tightly wound are they, as well as other things like is it merging with another galaxy or are there any rare features like gravitational lensing arcs. So this new iteration, Cosmic Dawn, is um, asking people to classify images taken by the Hypus Prime Cam, or HSE, on board the 8.2 meter Subaru telescope on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, so that's the telescopes pictured on the right. This is part of the Hawaii 2O or H2O Cosmic Dawn survey. So this Cosmic Dawn survey is a sort of large scale, 50 square degree multi wavelength survey of some of the darkest fields in the sky with the aim of studying how galaxies co-evolve with their central black holes and the dark matter halos that host them over cosmic time. H2O is one facet of this using ultra deep Subaru HSE imaging um, of some of the Euclid deep calibration fields, um, including the Euclid deep field north. Um, this is aiming to push the boundaries of extragalactic astronomy um, by studying galaxy evolution out to high redshift, right? so up to 800 million years after the Big Bang. And the project itself um, is presenting volunteers with hundreds of thousands of these images from this 10 square degree Euclid deep field north. So this has several benefits. So as I mentioned already, this is a precursor for LSST Rubin um, by providing the end of the project providing a um, multiband ground truth set that could be used for training deep learning models on images, such as for strong gravitational lens finding. It's also a precursor for Euclid because we're studying this Euclid deep field north. So we can provide initial classifications for rapid follow-up imaging. Um, there's also the fact that it has a higher end resolution um, with this combined with this deep multiband imaging. Um, we can study both higher redshift sources and low surface brightness features that have been quite elusive in previous iterations of Galaxy Zoo. And of course, um, with the help of citizen scientists rather than automated machines, we can expand the list of interesting objects through serendipitous discovery. So volunteers are still presented with the, the same sort of decision tree of questions that they're used to. But we've also expanded on this to include a question on clumpy galaxies, which I'll leave to Hugh to talk about in a, mo in a moment. Um, and expanding on um, the things that aren't galaxies to help um, the H2O team improve their data reduction and modeling code. So asking, um, so there's an option there for bad image zoom, so there's incorrect zoom uh, scaling of the image, as well as um, any types of artifacts, not just if there is an artifact, but what type of artifact is it? So this will help the H2O team um, with their code. So we can reduce the number of these instances in future. 
We're also placing a great emphasis on identifying gravitational lenses uh, due to their rarity. So it's the project itself has recently had its public launch, which was accompanied by a blog post. Um, and as of, as of I think yesterday, there was around three or over 380,000 classifications made by volunteers. So it's doing very well. So please feel free to join in and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, James, for your presentation. Our next speaker is Hugh Dickinson from Open University that will present the Super Wasp Black Hole Hunters and also the Galaxy Zoo Clamp Scout and also will provide an overview of managing citizen science from the escape as up together with James. Thank you and over to you, Hugh. Right. Hello. I, I hope you can all hear me and I hope you can also all also see my slides. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today, first of all, about a project called Super Wasp Black Hole Hunter. Um, as the name probably suggests to you, this project is designed to search for hidden black holes within our galaxy. So for those of you who don't know, what is a black hole? A black hole is the end stage in the life of certain types of stars. So for normal stars like our sun, if we go along the top row in this image, they get to the end of their what we call their main sequence life. So they start to run out of the fuel that they're burning to produce the light that they do. And they change from being a yellow star into this thing called a red giant, a giant red star. Their outer layers puff up and they expand to a much larger size. And then when the fuel that they're burning to exist as a red giant runs out, eventually that outer envelope just drifts away and becomes a planetary nebula. And the core of the star is left behind as something that we call a white dwarf. However, if the star is somewhat more massive than our own sun, then it follows a different evolutionary path. So this massive star, as we go on the bottom row, it turns into something called a red supergiant. And then when that red supergiant runs out of fuel, instead of its outer, outer layers just expanding gently into space, um, instead, it collapses in on itself. And then the outer layers bounce off the thing that it's collapsed in onto in something called a supernova. And if the star is massive enough, even that supernova isn't sufficiently energetic to halt the collapse and the core of the star continues to collapse in on itself to form this thing called a black hole which is a very very dense region of the universe with a gravitational field that is so strong that even light if it gets too close can't escape so the escape velocity of a black hole is greater than the speed of light which is the fastest that anything can move in the universe so why are we searching for hidden black holes? Well, if we try and model the abundances of these massive stars in our galaxy and then work out how many of them are going to end their lives in this black hole state, then there should be a few hundred thousand black holes just in our own Milky Way. Now, that's fine, but the problem is we've only detected about 30 of them, and that's because of the ways that we've been using to detect them so far rely on them emitting X radiation, and only a small fraction of the black holes that exist are expected to do that. So what we've done is we've tried to use a new way of detecting these black holes, and that's through a phenomenon called gravitational lensing. So because the gravitational field of these black holes is so strong, um, it actually bends the path of light rays that go near to the near to the black hole, but don't go quite near enough to fall in and be lost from the universe. And that bending of the light rays acts a little bit like a lens and it can magnify the light from objects behind them. So in this case, this diagram that I'm showing is a black hole that's orbiting a normal star. And as the black hole passes between that normal star and us observers on Earth, what it does is it actually magnifies the light from the star. So if we're observing the light of that star, what we see is that the light of that star uh, brightens briefly uh, and it forms this very uh, distinctive uh, what we call light curve shape with a symmetric peak and so that's what we're going to try and look for so we've got our new technique to try and find black holes but now we need to, to come up with a technique to actually find them in some data and we're going to use a citizen science technique to do this and the data that we're going to use come from this telescope which is called the wide angle search for planets or Super Wasp for short. 
Um, and it's a telescope that surveyed a large part of the sky, but even more importantly, it surveyed it very regularly. So it surveyed individual stars down to time separations of uh, as small as 40 seconds. And that allows for us to, to really find very short timescale signals. So in that sense, it's a little bit like a precursor for the Vera Rubin Observatory and uh, their legacy survey of space and time. The big difference is, though, that while the Vera Rubin Observatory is a five meter class telescope, each of these small telescopes is really just a CCD with a big telephoto lens that you would find on a normal uh, DSLR camera attached to it. So the quality of the data won't be quite as good. And that's actually why we need the citizen science approach. So we built this project and I invite you to go and have a look at it. It's paused at the moment. We, we hope it will be coming back. And what we ask volunteers to look at is things like this. So this is actually a simulated image. I should say that immediately. The real light curves don't have this gray band to help the volunteers. But we're asking them to look at this quite noisy data and find these symmetric peaks. So here's a really obvious one. Here's one that's slightly less obvious. And then here's one that's even more subtle. OK, so these are quite difficult for automatic algorithms to find, uh, especially if you don't know exactly how wide or how high they have to be. Now, what the volunteers are actually looking at is stuff that's a lot more like this. So it, it's a difficult problem for the volunteers. It's even more difficult for automatic algorithms. Let me show you one more example. Um, so to, to actually search through all of these all of these light curves and to search many, many stars for these very, very rare black hole events, uh, we need to we need to look at a lot of systems. So let's have a look at some of the numbers involved with this project. We've engaged five and a half thousand volunteers and between them they've looked already at two, over 200,000 light curves and that comes to about two million classifications of these light curves. So there's a huge amount of effort going into this project and just to quickly show you some results these are some of the most promising results that we have so far. So this is here we see a symmetric peak in a light curve. Here's another one that's quite promising. And here's one that we thought was really promising. But this tells you that you have to be careful with all of this stuff, because when you go and check very carefully, we found that this is actually a normal type of variable star. And in fact, if we looked really closely, we could have told that by the fact it's a slightly asymmetric light curve. So analysis of the data from this project is still ongoing. Um, and uh, watch this space for more results coming up soon. So thank you for that one. I think I should move straight on and talk about the second citizen science project that I've been asked to talk about today, which is Galaxy Zoo Clump Scout. And this ties in a little bit with the talk you just saw from James. Um, so Galaxy Zoo Clump Scout is a project in which we're searching for a phenomenon called giant star forming clumps. OK, so what are giant star forming clumps? Well, the story of them really starts with this image, which was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope back in 2004. And this is an image of part of the sky that was thought to be blank initially, but when Hubble looked at it for several weeks, in fact, it was found to be full of thousands of galaxies. And these galaxies, we're seeing them as they were about 10 billion years ago. Now, what's even more interesting is that if we zoom in on these galaxies, they don't look very much like the typical galaxy that we would see today. So the typical galaxy we would see today looks something like this. It has the lovely spiral arm structure with the stars forming roughly evenly distributed throughout those spiral arms. Now, the galaxies we see in this image don't look like that at all. Instead, they have this really irregular clumpy structure where you see that the star formation is concentrated in these bright things. And those are the giant clumps that we're interested in. Um, today, of course, we can also look with JWST and we see that in this JWST image, there are more examples of these clumpy galaxies. Now, the thing is, all of these clumpy galaxies are very distant. We're seeing them as they were in the universe's distant past. It turns out that although they're very common in these images, clumpy galaxies are much less common if we look at local galaxies in, in the more modern universe. So our citizen science project is designed to, to search a very large area of the sky to find these much rarer local clumpy galaxies. To do that, we show volunteers images that look a lot like the images from the Galaxy Zoo project. And we say, can you please click on all the locations of the clumps that you see in this image? And once they've done that, um, 
we can then get a catalogue of all of the clumpy galaxies in the local universe and the clumps they contain. So this project was very successful. We engaged 15,000 volunteers. They inspected 80,000 galaxies. And amongst those galaxies, they found that 35,000 of them were clumpy. And that gave us a catalogue of about 100,000 potential clumps. And that catalogue has been released in a paper this year. Um, it also allows us to train deep learning models. So we've been able to use that catalog to start training deep learning models. And we find that the generic deep learning models are actually four times more sensitive than the citizen science approach. However, we could never have trained them without the citizen science approach to start with. So the citizen science approach is really important. Here's the final numbers from the Galaxy Zoo Clump Scout project. I've already told you the top row. There are already two scientific papers out. The first catalog has been released. We've trained the machine learning model and there's a third paper in preparation. So one thing I want to really make clear from this talk is that citizen science is not just an outreach tool, it's a tool for doing real scientific analysis and it produces publishable research. So once again, thank you for listening. And actually, uh, I think it's James who's gonna take the lead on the next talk, so. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, yes, so uh, earlier we heard about Escape's Work Package 5, this science analysis platform, ESAP. Um, and at the Open University, supported by both Escape and EOSC Future, we're working we're busy working on a subject that combines both work package, packages five and six. That's uh, the science analysis platform and the citizen science side of things uh, through managing citizen science projects using ESAP. And I should say that EOSC Future is a, another Horizon 2020 project that is in charge of implementing the European Open Science Cloud to which the escape services will contribute. So, as I've talked about before, Zooniverse is the world's largest and most popular platform for citizen science, allowing professional researchers to set up their own scientifically driven um, data mining experiments across all ranges of disciplines from art and history to sp space and climate science. Now, the Zooniverse platform has guides on the basics of setting up and managing projects through the project builder web interface that they have shown in the background here. But Zooniverse also has its own backend API called Panoptes, which allows for more advanced project building and manage management options. Um, and researchers can access these through the Panoptes Python client, shown on the right. Uh, but this has been challenging for researchers to sort of understand how to use to, the, to its fullest advantage. So to facilitate the advanced creation of citizen science projects for both the escape partners as well as fostering interest in escape from researchers, we've turned to the science analysis platform. Through its user interface, ESAP has the functionality for storing and running Jupyter notebooks for the interactive analysis um, side of things. And the ESAP archives allow you to retrieve data from external sites. So shown here, we've got the Zooniverse classification database that has been integrated into this via the Panoptes API. So the aim of this work is basically to create a suite of easy to use tutorial materials and workflow material to aid researchers um, in creating and managing new Zooniverse projects through ESAP. And these tutorials cover a range of things from advanced project, project building techniques um, in managing subject sets and metadata to using Zooniverse's CESA engine for advanced aggregation of results and advanced subject retirement rules. Um, as well as how to access the ESAP shopping basket to download uh, Zooniverse data for aggreg aggregation. Um, and we've also uh, talked about how to demonstrate ways in which we can co combine citizen science with deep learning models to sort of get the best of both worlds. So we can set up an active learning framework to simultaneously improve the machine learning uh, performance as well as the experience of volunteers so they can focus on more interesting things rather than basic things that a machine could classify very easily. So the material for all of these tutorials are stored and maintained openly on the ESAP's GitLab page and are accessible through the ESAP user interface that we've heard about um, a number of times so far.
So for example, in the middle here, I can search the interactive analysis workflows for one of these tutorials. In this case, selecting the advanced project building workflow. I can then select a compute facility, in this case, deploying it to a my binder instance. And this will spin up a binder. Um, and soon I'm presented with a Jupyter lab containing the workflow for which I can access all the tutorial notebook and other materials ready to use. So in addition to this, uh, we also were thinking about how can we uh, best help researchers utilize the results they're getting from citizen science. Um, and so our aspiration is to develop a virtual observatory tool that allows for data exploration of these universe classifications of astronomical objects as a sort of in addition to the usual virtual observatory um, method. So for example, you might start with this IPy Aladdin widget in a Jupyter notebook. Um, then you can load a module, let's call it Galaxy Zoo, for instance, uh, from this Panopti's backend. We can then search the region of sky using this, which is sort of an all we can search the sky for objects that have been classified by Galaxy Zoo, as indicated by the white squares. Um, we can zoom out a bit because Zooniverse, uh, sorry, uh, Galaxy Zoo projects cover a, a lot of, a huge number of objects. Um, and this would, we can then sort of click on one and we can, as a normal virtual observatory, we can uh, access this data um, that uh, the volunteers have produced as part of, through this classification process. Uh, and so all these labeled Galaxy Zoo morphologies are available for researchers to use. Um, not just the research team themselves, but once the data becomes publicly available, any researcher could benefit from this. Um, and not just researchers, volunteers are also keen on jumping out to external tools beyond the Zooniverse web interface. Uh, so some already are uh, using metadata provided by Galaxy Zoo to jump out to professional astronomy tools and databases, so they too could benefit from this. So combined, combining this with the earlier tutorial material, this work allows professional researchers to combine the powers of both um, the science analysis platform and citizens, citizen science for their own research, as well as allowing volunteers to engage even further with this research and with astronomy in general. So, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, now I'll give the word back to Stephen that will share with us the Escape Citizen Science Future Plans. Okay, let's see if I can make this share. There, can you see my screen and everything working? Yes. Marvellous. Okay, so I've just got a single slide on where next for citizen, citizen science in the European Open Science Cloud. So one question that we've been exercised on is what limits the take up of crowdsourced data mining in EOSC? And there are a few things that we came up with. Trust in the reliability. It's not a magic bullet, much in the same way as uh, machine learning is not a magic bullet. Um, skills at ag aggregating the data, pulling it all together and making scientific products out of it. Temptation just to pay Mechanical Turk. And I think uh, what will help here is seeing some science results and seeing it work up close. So these uh, uh, notebook exemplars that James has been showing, I think will be very important. So we could certainly do with more of that. And uh, building multidisciplinary exemplar exper experiments would help. So I think we're getting the message across, unless I'm <laughs> flattering myself, I think we're getting the message across in astronomy and astroparticle physics in the escape context. But it would be good to see more uptake of crowdsourced data mining uh, beyond those subject areas. And I think these worked examples will be very, very helpful for that. Also, we should be looking at improving the integration with other EOSC services like the Virtual Observatory. Um, we were just seeing an uh, IPI Aladdin just now. AAI, Virtuous Circle with uh, ESAP machine learning that um, uh, we've uh, uh, heard about from Hugh's talk. This, of course, only applies for the, uh, the bigger data sets. Sharing open data standards in, in uh, the EOSC uh, project fairsharing.org. Maybe we should be having a, a dedicated EOSC task force for citizen science because it is quite a distinct use case and I think it might benefit from that. And ideally, I would love to see more funding for uh, an ESAP platform specifically for multi or interdisciplinary citizen science projects. 
So those are my uh, hopes and aspirations for the future. And I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Stephen, for your presentation. Now, uh, let's see if there are uh, questions from the audience. The moment we don't see any question, let's wait a couple of seconds. Okay, so um, if there aren't any question, I think um, we can see if any of the speaker have anything to add, otherwise we can close the webinar. Okay, so uh, still no questions. So I think it's time to thank all your all the speakers for your insights and for joining co and contributing to this webinar. Thanks also to all the participants for joining and listening. Uh, of course, you will be able to find the webinar recording and the presentations on the event page in the coming days. Thank you very much and um, have a lovely Monday. Thanks all. Thank you. All right.